1 Corinthians 13 is probably one of the most greatest chapters in the entire Bible. Matter of fact, it's a, it's a chapter on charity, and uh, it's, it's divided into three parts. The first three verses, 1, 2, and 3, are, are deal with the value of, of charity. And verses 4, 5, 6, and 7 deal with the virtue of charity. And the remainder of the chapter deal with the victory of charity. I think, um, I want to start with verse 4. We'll read two verses and then we'll try to preach. Charity suffereth long. Charity is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. Charity is not puffed up. Charity doth not behave itself unseemly. Charity seeketh not her own. And charity is not easily provoked. And here's the part where I want you to see charity. What's the next word? Thinketh no evil. You may be seated. Charity thinketh no evil. I want, to, I want to deal with that phrase, charity, thinketh no evil. Now, uh, I'm a little nervous that so y'all pray for me. Uh, I, I, I'm a songwriter, and I say that humbly. I've wrote several songs and been recorded by different folks across the nation. And they're always, if you're a songwriter, when you get around a song, another songwriter, there's always sort of a story behind the song. You know what I'm saying? There's just how you got the song or whatever. But I want to I wanna start out with giving you a story behind the sermon. Because this is personal, very personal to me. I want to share something with you today that I felt God helped me and my wife with. Several months ago, we were uh, like Brother Tim. I don't want to be transparent too much, but we were struggling and and in in the heart of a great, great, severe satanic, uh, probably the greatest in 35 years of being saved. And uh, I'm not talking about church trouble since I'm a pastor, so let me give you a disclaimer there. You're right. But we were we were dealing with things and a couple of issues. And I noticed one day me and my wife were in the privacy of our home. And I want that to sink in. We went around our children. We went around anybody else, just the privacy of our own home. And we were discussing something in our lives. And the, the tone of our voice was just not good. We was, we was talking about this, and it was not good. All right. and, uh, and I stopped my wife, and I said, Baby, I think uh, me and you are battling resentment with everything else and she started crying and she said she said I th- she said I think I have resentment she said I know I do and I looked at her and I said baby I do too I said I sense that in me and you now we went around around nobody else and most people probably oh that's crazy just talk how you want no not if you're really trying to live for God and you really want to be and you just want your heart to be right with God. I sensed that me and her had such a tone when we was talking about something else. Not against one another, but about something else. And, uh, and so I, I prayed and I sought the Lord. And so I went to the Bible and I tried to find everything I could about resentment. Because faith cometh by what? Hearing and hearing by the word of God. And I said, God, I... I need help. We need help. We need we need a touch of God. And so the Lord in that behind the sermon here, the story behind the sermon, is I went to study and I didn't find this in a sermon book and I have books. There's nothing wrong with that. And but I, I went to searching and my, my one of my main things went to this charity thinketh no evil. In all of my life in Bible reading and, and reading Henry Drummond's book on this, the greatest, you know, greatest chapter in the Bible on love, I always thought when it said charity thinketh, I thought, you know, don't have no uh, uh, wicked thoughts, keep a, 
keep a clean mind, don't have dirty thoughts, don't have wicked thoughts, and that, that kind of thing, just thinketh. And, but I found a, the word thinketh in the Greek actually means something totally different than just a thought of wickedness. The word in the Greek and that says thinketh means this. It means to take inventory. Now notice this. Charity thinketh what? No evil. So here's what it means in the Greek. To take inventory, to count, to impute, to number, to think, or to take into account. So literally, literally, it's a book-keeping term. And the purpose of entering numbers into a journal or a ledger is to make a permanent record. Why? So that you can go back later, if need be, and consult the record that you have made. Right? Now in business, in business, that's wise to keep good records. Amen. In business, it's very important and it's necessary. But in relationships, in personal relationships, it is unnecessary. It is harmful. And it's a silent killer. So I'm going to preach to you today on the silent relationship killer. So literally, this text is saying this. Love does not keep a record of the wrong that is done to it. Love does not calculate the wrong done to it. Love doesn't keep a fallen cabinet huh, of all the wrongs done to it. You know... Sometimes me and my wife have disagreements through the years. We've been married 34 years almost. And uh, I'm going to give all the young couples some advice here. Do not do this. But I have been guilty in my years of being married. And when we get having a disagreement. And uh, and then, you know, ain't it funny how sometimes as a a husband and wife, you you can get in a disagreement. And if it gets really heated... You say something like, you know, you've always been like this. Now, why are you all laughing and smiling for us? I'm like, how many is it? Well, I won't ask you how many's ever done that, but you understand what I'm, you know what you just did? That shows that you had a filing cabinet of every mistake she's ever made. And when you got mad enough, you want to throw it out there. Charity thinketh it doesn't keep count. I've been guilty. I've been guilty. So I want to. I want to just. I'm just going to be slow. I mean, you know, because it's two o'clock and you're about ready to take a nap, and Kevin Lloyd's coming after. So I want to just preach to you a little bit. Romans chapter four is another place in the Bible that that same Greek word is is given. And so I'm going to try to give you three verses really quick and uh, preach to you a little bit about this this charity thinketh no evil. I I don't know about you, but I I want to be holiness. Not on just my externals, but I want to be holy on the inside. I want my heart, my mind, I want my mouth to say things that are holy. And when me and my wife were talking about January of this year, this isn't a message I've just wore out a hundred times, okay? I just got this and preached it at my church in late February, and I preached it two or three times, and I was uh, uh, just just praying about what to preach today, and this is what I felt like the Lord. But, boy, I just noticed when we were talking that tone of voice. I, I want to keep going. At it. You'll see here in a minute while I'm saying that. But notice with me in Romans chapter 4. Here's the same word. Same Greek word, Romans 4, in verse number 8. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not, what's the next word? Impute. 
sin. <laughs> wow. That word impute is the same Greek word, the exact same word, charity. Think if the word impute, blessed is the man whom the Lord, the Lord, when you get saved, God doesn't keep a filing cabinet of your past sins. Can I hear an amen? No wonder it says, blessed is the man. I'm glad that God doesn't keep count of everything in my past once I am forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. Wow. Blessed is the man whom the Lord will not keep a, a record of his sin. God doesn't keep, amen, a, a record of our past sins. God doesn't have a filing cabinet with folders filled with our past sins when you're covered by the blood. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 9, the Greek word again is used. Help me here, Holy Ghost. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5 and verse 19 says that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. That's powerful. God, amen, was in Christ reconciling the world and God didn't say, I've had it up to here with their sin. The scripture said God wasn't doing that. He wasn't imputing their trespasses against them. He wasn't holding it against them. And he sent Christ to reconcile them. It was God in Christ reconciling and restoring the world to favor with himself. Not counting up. Amen. And holding against men their trespasses. I want to give you a positive example. The book of Philippians chapter number 4. Stay with me. Philippians chapter 4. The same Greek word is mentioned. I want you to understand. I'm going to go back to that. Charity thinketh. It doesn't keep a record of the wrong. It doesn't have a fallen cabinet. Help me here, Holy Ghost. Philippians chapter number 4 and verse number 8. Very familiar. Finally, my brethren, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, do what? Come on, church, help me. What does it say? Think. Now, you probably was like me. I always just thought, well, that just means to think about it and give God the glory. That's not what that word means, think. huh? That word means I want you to keep a filing cabinet of every good thing I've done for you. That's in a positive manner. Did you see that? God said, think, keep a record. Now, in my Bible here, Amen. I, I have a little wore out piece of paper. Amen. That I've had probably almost 30 years now. I wish I'd have started when I first got saved. But there's about 20, 25 major miracles that God has done in mine and my wife's personal life that I've, I've wrote down. Amen. And I've kept in my Bible. And I, when I pray my daily prayer, my main prayer, I usually have my Bible right here before me. And I don't know, I can't tell you the times that I have pulled this little piece of paper right here, especially when we're facing situations in our life. Amen. Wondering how God's going to move. And I'm going to pull this record out of my Bible because I think on the, I've kept a record of the good things. Anybody knows what I'm talking about? Anybody got some good things God has done for you? I remember one of the, one of the things I've got here is when I was preaching a revival for Melvin Rose in Duggar, Indiana, through the Shady Springs Fellowship. And I was there in revival, and I was 26, 28, 29, somewhere through there, just getting started. And I was there in revival, and I had a severe kidney affection and uh, a severe pain for about several weeks. And, 
And uh, long story short, one morning about 9 o'clock, I was in the little camper there that we had, a little, a little I think it was a 16 and a half foot nomad, I think. We was big time back then. And uh, uh, camper-wise, anyhow, you get the picture. And uh, 16 and a half foot, if you ought to catch that. And, and uh, I walked in. I said, I'm going to go in and pray. I need a touch of God. And I remember I walked in that little country church, and Brother Philip, they had wood floors. And I remember I walked down. I, I remember the place that the, uh, on this side of the pulpit. And I got down, and I just on my knees, and I was just praying. I said, Lord, I said, the reason I've come in here to ask you to heal me is that. And I was going to say, because that I know you're a healer. When I said the word that, amen, God Instantly, the only time in my life of 52 years, I've not been that sick. My blood pressure is great. I've been really, really healthy. Never been in a hospital in my life since, since I was born. Amen. So, I, I, But the only time, I mean, I was in severe pain. But when I got to the word that, you said, do you remember that? I absolutely remember the precise word that I said because God instantly, instantly, divinely healed me. Amen. I, I remember, I, I stopped right mid-sentence. Amen. I've got that on my little list of here, of my little filing can of the good things God has done. And I remember, I, I, I raised up, I was on my knees, and I looked around, it was just me in that little country church, and I said, God, you just healed me. And I remember smiling, brother, uh, brother Seth, I remember, God, you just you just touched me. You just healed me. Amen. And uh, I remember getting up. I said, if this is God, there won't be any pain. And I, I started doing this number. I was there all by myself. Amen. And you know what? I have never to this day ever felt that pain again. God divinely worked a miracle in this little preacher boy's life. Amen. When I was in my 20s, and guess what? I've got it wrote down on my little record book. Amen. But the Bible said, my text says, Charity thinketh no evil. Do you understand that if we would live those charity thinketh no, if we would live those four words, listen to me, there would never be another divorce. If we live those four words, charity thinketh no evil. There will never be another church split. Nobody, no church trouble. You talking about holiness. You talking about somebody talking about being tight, but it's right. Amen. You, you know, I gave up my television. It took six months or so when I was just a young man. God dealt with me. Amen. But you know what? Here I was, I was 51, I'm 52 now, and here I am fighting resentment back in January. Amen. I, I, I'm not fighting television, and I'm not fighting things like that, but the things in my heart that's just nobody can see. But I'm thankful, I'm thankful that I could recognize it, and my wife recognized it. And I told her, I said, honey, and I mentioned somebody's name. I said, if we're not careful, we're going to be just like them, and God can sideline us over here. Amen. And we'll become nobodies and everybody will wonder what happened to them. They fell off the face of the earth. I said, let's don't let that happen to us. And so you know what I did? I began to dig in the word of God. Amen. To try to find something that would help my soul to grab enough faith to rise out of that pit before it got a hold of my heart. So I went to the Bible. So now you understand, charity thinketh, doesn't keep account. In the strangest place I found a man in the Bible on his deathbed. Amen. In 1 Kings chapter 2. If you have your Bible, go with me. I'm going to take my time. Was that okay? Yes, sir. Amen. 1 Kings chapter 2. You need your Bible. You're going to need your Bible. I'm going to go through three or three verses. And I'm telling you, I feel in prayer. Amen. I say this humbly. But I feel like God is wanting to touch somebody here. Amen. Oh yeah. First Kings chapter 2. It's David in the life of David. And he's, he's dying. He's on his deathbed. 
he, he's drawing nigh that he should die. And he calls Solomon, his son, in. You know, so you have a dying father talking to his son Solomon. And notice what he says. He says, Solomon, I go the way. Verse 2. 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 2. 1 Kings 2 and 2. Amen. Solomon, I go the way of all the earth. Be thou strong, therefore, and show thyself a man. Rise up, Solomon. Be a man. Keep, keep the charge of the Lord, Solomon. I have a son named Isaac. He's almost 20. I can sense, I can, I know what a father and a son, that relationship. I can see me on my dying bed saying, Isaac, keep the charge of the Lord. Walk in his ways to keep his statues and his commandments. Can you see this father? Now, let me share this. When I, a lot of times I, I listen to the dramatized Bible. Y'all don't, y'all don't fall out with me, okay? It's KJV and I love listening to it. I mean, I, I wear it out driving on the road all the time, going to hospitals and go to church and cutting grass. I mean, I'm continually listening to the dramatized King James Version Bible. It's awesome. I got an app on my phone. And, and when you're listening to this part right here where David is saying, Solomon, the music is soft. The music is soft and there's some piano in the background and David's voice is soft. And he's telling David, David, uh, uh, Solomon, keep the charge of the Lord. You can almost sense a, a pause, a hesitant in his voice. Solomon, walk in his ways. Solomon, keep his statutes, keep his commandments, keep his judgments, his testimonies. As it is written in the law of Moses that thou mayest prosper. Solomon, I want you to prosper in all that thou doest and wherever, soever thou turnest thyself. If the Lord may continue his word, which he spake concerning me. I'm, I'm fixing to die, Solomon, but I'm going to pass on. And, and if thy children, he said to me, Solomon, take heed to their, their way to walk before me. Solomon, listen to me. God gave me a promise about you. If thy children take heed to, to their way and to walk before me in the truth with all their heart and with all their soul, there shall not fail thee, said he, a man on the throne of David. Solomon, stay with God. But verse 5 says, moreover, and on the dramatized app, the music begins to get real somber. And the mood changes. And so when you read the next verse, you can't read it like a soft, tender Man that's sobbing to his son. There's a little sarcastic. Moreover Solomon. I want to tell you something else. Thou knowest also. What Joab. Did to me. Wow. I tell you when you share your hurts. With your children. So your offense will become their offense. You got it bad. Solomon, I want you to remember Joab, what he did to me. What he did to the two captains and a master of the son, what he did to them and whom he slew and he shed the blood of war and peace and put the blood of war upon his girdle that was about his loins and his shoes that... Do therefore, listen to what he's telling them to do. He's recommend. do therefore according to thy wisdom. Let me tell you something. He's playing on his own son's wisdom. Solomon, you're a wise young man. You'll know how to handle Joab. Now, when it comes down to verse 6, you see that in your Bible? And it says, and let not his whore head, his old age, Go down to the grave in peace. When it says that, in my Bible, I got that circle right there. Let not his whore head, because the voice on the dramatized. Go home and listen to it. Solomon, let not his whore head go down. Do you sense that? David, you're dying. You just, you just gave your advice to Solomon that... Please follow after God, Solomon. 
what are you doing, David? You're telling him to remember what Joab did to me? Don't let him die in peace. I don't care if he's an old man. Don't let him die in peace, Solomon. Get him. Don't forget what he did to your daddy. Brother Philip mentioned the Hatfield and McCoy feud. Randall McCoy, Randall McCoy, amen, when, when he would have a funeral of his sons in the McCoy family, every, every McCoy funeral, Randolph McCoy would have quoted Psalms 139, 22. I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. They said that was Randolph McCoy's favorite verse in the Bible. Do you know Randolph McCoy never killed a Hatfield? He never killed a Hatfield. His sons. He drilled that hate into his sons. I tell you, charity thinketh no evil. David isn't talking to his son here, and I'm hurrying. David comes on down in verse 8. Look at it with me. And David says again, another man. And behold, Solomon, thou hast with thee Shimei, which cursed me with a grievous curse. Notice what he said. Therefore, now, verse 9, now therefore hold him not guiltless, for thou, amen, art a wise man. Again, he plays on Solomon's. You're going to know what to do, Solomon. And knowest what thou oughtest to do unto him. And again, the dramatized version changes right here when it says, But his whore head bring thou down to the grave with what? Wow. Joab, Shimeon, David. He's passing on his offense to his children. I... uh, I remember a man, a holiness man, about 34, 33 years ago that I met right after I got saved. Matter of fact, he was a snake handler, to be honest with you. When I got saved and going to that little Pentecostal church there, Brother Horton there at Bledsoe, Kentucky, I wasn't even holiness then. We went to a little church. I didn't know. I wasn't a rebel. I just didn't know about holiness. We just, I just got saved and saved a year or two and just got married and going to that little church. And there was a holiness preacher that would come through sometimes and that's just how they do in Harlan, and, and we, 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 we wasn't a snake handling church, of course, but our pastor there, Brother Brock, would allow this man to preach some through, through the years there, and, and, uh, and I never forget, you know, I, I, he, I didn't see him no more for several years, and, and uh, then I got on into holiness and pastoring, and I was my first church, and, and then I heard, I heard a story, and they said, do you remember so-and-so? And I said, yeah, I remember his name. And they said, do you know he's in prison? And I said, in prison? He's a holiness. He was a holiness guy. What's he in prison? And they, they tell the story that, that uh, somebody had tried to hurt him. And I actually, I actually called after I left Bristow, Brother, Brother, Brother Darrell. I called a local pastor that I knew, knew this man more than I did. And I rehearsed the story. Amen. And, and somebody, amen, had tried to shoot at this, this pastor, this holiness pastor. And do you know, he allowed charity thinketh no evil. He allowed resentment to get in his heart. Resentment turns into bitterness. Bitterness turns into anger. Anger turns into hatred. Hatred turns into murder. Do you know that he talked his own daughter his own daughter in killing the person with his own gun, amen, the person that threatened him. And he went to prison with his daughter. Help me here, Holy Ghost. You say, that's extreme. It is. You may not take a gun and shoot your enemy, but you'll take your tongue. I'm trying to help you. I'm not preaching down to you. I'm here to help you. I hope you sense that. 
my tone of voice, me and my wife. Am I, am I making any sense? Uh, maybe I'm a little too transparent. I mean, here I am a pastor of a church. Of, we got about 120 people, and God's a, helping us mightily where I'm at. Amen. I give God the glory, Brother Kevin. But here my wife, we're in the privacy of my home. And we're talking, Brother Tim, and the tone of voice that we're talking about something else. I don't like it. I, and I stopped her. I said, look at us. Look at the way we're talking. Look at, look at the tone. It's quiet. You know where I'm at, don't you? Hurt. You get hurt. It's tough. W.D. King. How many remember Brother King from Florida? Brother King tells a story of a man in this church and a young preacher boy had been a preacher for years, 10, 15, 20 years in his church. A, a man, they had a little child about three or four years old and, and the child became sick, very, very sick. And one night, amen, in church service, Brother King prophesied over the little child and told him the child was going to get well. Later that night, the child grew worse. They rushed it to the emergency surgery or emergency room, and the doctor said, "This, the, you know, this has got to have emergency, emergency surgery." I don't know all the details. I called Brother King a few weeks ago and, and rehearsed this again with him, and he told me the story again because he preached the whole sermon on it. So I'm not being unethical telling you the the story. And he and he said the man, the father of the child, was so upset at Brother King, his pastor, Amen, that he Amen brought a leather belt. He come and he said, I'm going to go back to the church and I'm going to find Brother King and I'm going to whip brother king with my leather belt and he got there and there was family around some church people around and the man got out of his truck and said you prophesied a lie my baby's going to die if it don't have surgery you said my baby was going to get better charity thinketh no evil some of them that began to cry and said can we call 911 and he said no and the man literally took off his belt his leather belt I'm not telling something in the Clarence McCartney book or F.W. Born I'm talking about one of our holiness pastors the man literally jerked off his belt and whipped Brother King with his leather belt with the buckle because he's so full of resentment that he had prophesied. But, you heard him tell it, Amen. But Brother King told me, he said, but Brother Rick, when the doctor the next day, amen, went to do the surgery on the child, the doctor got in there and said, there's nothing wrong with this child. Amen. The child is completely better. There's completely well. There's no need for surgery. And it was just like the man of God said. I understand that's very extreme too. But if we're not careful, we don't jerk out a belt. Amen because we've been hurt but you know what we do amen we tell our story to everybody we want everybody to know how we've been hurt amen and i'm not belittling the hurt i'm not belittling i've been hurt amen i'm not belittling the hurt you're not hearing me say get over it amen just get over it just pray through amen just 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 get over it i'm not saying that Amen. The Bible commands us, charity thinketh no. Have you got a filing cabinet? I'm hurrying. One woman that I was told, one of the deacons told me, said, Brother Rick, says she keeps a literal journal. She has her whole life, 20 some years of being in church. She keeps a literal journal of every church trouble that's ever happened at the church. I'd hate to die and meet God. Me knowing I had a journal of every church problem that happened. You may not have a journal, but do you have a filing cabinet in your heart? Now, and I'm not just talking about church stuff. Let's get real personal. What about When you have a real mother like I do that lives in Chicago that's close to in her 70s that never calls, never a Christmas card in 40 plus years, none, zero. She's never hugged any of my grandkids. There's no relationship. I remember as a child fighting that 
bitterness and that resentment. Why don't you love me? It ain't just church trouble. It's family trouble. You know what I'm saying? Because your, your resentment, we hear a lot about bitterness. We pray over bitterness. We, we, we confess bitterness. We pray about it. When's the last time you heard an entire sermon on resentment? Resentment is the root. Bitterness is the fruit. What happens is you come to the altar like last night and this morning and you get victory over that bitterness and you feel like God's touched you and He has and you feel victory and He has gave you victory and then you go about six months. Help me preach a little bit. You go about a year or six months and something happens. A name is spoken. You see something and all of a sudden that feeling rises back up. And you thought, and here's what happens. The devil says, you never got victory over that bitterness. Yes, you got victory over that bitterness, but you never dealt with the root of the problem, that resentment. Help me preach a little bit. Amen. Hebrews says it like this. Amen. Looking diligent lest to any what? Amen. Lest anyone fail of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. Huh? Oh, help me here, Holy Ghost. Now, I don't want to leave you in a ditch. I want to help you to get out. There's five things. There's a remedy. You can overcome resentment. Because I'm telling you, God took this. And I showed my wife, and me and her prayed over this before I ever preached it. I said, baby, this, this is just another trick. God has helped us miraculously through the years, and we've overcome great obstacles in life. Amen. And challenges and great things that the Lord has done and great mountains and you know and just different things and I said look this ain't nothing we're over here we're over here in this tone of voice I want to keep mentioning that I want that to sink in because somehow we think we 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 we, we sometimes we think when we're in a privacy of our home and we're driving down the road in our own car and it's just our spouse we can do and you know what sometimes us preachers we love to use that illustration about, ah, oh, you're sitting around a dinner table and you're eating your chicken and you're eating your preacher too. How many of you ever heard that phrase, that illustration? But somehow, I've never heard anybody say, what about a preacher? <laughs> it's eating on his, and him and his wife are just yakking. Probably nobody here has been guilty of that. Charity thinketh no evil. There's five things really quick. Can I have just two or three more minutes and close? There's five things. I want, I want it free. Now, some of these are going to sound crazy, but I'm telling you what I know. And I say that humbly. The first thing you've got to do to get over that, it's good people. Praying people. Brother, I say this humbly. Brother Tim, I went on a 21-day fast last July. Need a touch of God. There's not people that wants to go back in the world and backslide. It's people that's praying and seeking God. But the little bit of resentment. And that filing came it over here. I can't get it out of my mind. The first thing you have to do is you've got to seriously... Reevaluate it. You got to confess it and forsake it. Can I hear an amen? You don't. You don't. Uh, you do not uh, confess it in church. That's not what I mean. I think it's good if you write it down on a piece of paper. Literally, take your pencil out, pen, and in prayer, in prayer, go to this chapter. 13, verse 5, charity thinketh no evil and write your sin down. That's exactly what I said. I didn't stutter. Write it down. God, I've had this fallen candidate in my life for so long. And here's their name. Here's what happened. And here it is, God. I'm confessing it. I'm writing it down. And I'm telling you, that's harder. It sounds easy. 
But it's harder to do. Write it on a literal piece of paper. Pray over it. And say, God, I want to dig down not just the bitterness. I want to get down to the root. The very violent can it, God. I can remember 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 5 years ago, 3 years ago. I got a good record of the things that they did. Write it down. And when you get done praying over it, shred it into a million pieces and catch it on fire if you can. I preached this little sermon a few weeks at Jersey, Brother Philip. I was requested to preach this at Jersey just three or four weeks ago, and I preached this at Jersey. Somebody heard me at Bristol, and I preached it at Jersey. When I got done preaching at Jersey a few weeks ago, Neil Bridges, y'all brother know Brother Bridges? He come up to me and said, Brother Rick, he said, let me tell you a story. Everybody went out of the sanctuary. He said, come over here, let me tell you a story. And real quick, 30 seconds. He said, I knew a man, an older man that got right with God. But he said, that man was a little boy and his mama left him and several of siblings. And they, she never came back. He never seen her again. But he was so resentful and so full of bitterness and hatred and murder toward his mother that when he got to be a teenager and a young man, he said, if I ever see my mother, I'm going to kill her for what she did to us. I'm going to kill her. He became an older man, Brother Bridges said, and said he was on a deathbed and said uh, his mother had died somehow a year or two before that, but he couldn't get that out of his heart even though his mother was dead. And Brother Bridges said, Brother Rick, you know how he got to victory? How he got right with God? Because he was trying to get saved and he couldn't pray over that. He said he wrote a letter to his mother. Brother Bridges told me this three weeks ago. He said a letter, he wrote a letter to his mother, a dead mother that he hadn't seen since he was a little four or five year old boy. And he talked about mama. Why weren't you there? And he just wrote a letter, three or four page letter. I feel the Holy Ghost here. And uh, he wrote this letter. And he says, Mama, I'm trying to get right with God. Would you please forgive me? And Brother Bridges said, an RN nurse came in. And the man said, would you read this letter, ma'am? Would you read this out loud? Because I want God to hear it. Because I'm trying to get saved. And i got to get this out of my heart. And the nurse began to read the letter. And she was crying. And he was crying. And he told Brother Bridges later. He said, that's how I got saved. I was able to forgive my mother. Amen. Of leaving us as a little boy. Write it down. Amen. And then rip it up. You've got to admit it. I'm telling you that is so hard to do. Amen. We had been fighting that for months. My wife said, I'm not bitter. I'm not resentful. And I would say, I'm not resentful. We're just talking. But there was one day, the tone of our voice. I said, I looked at it. We stand in the bedroom. We're at the foot of the bed. We're standing there. I remember I looked there and said, I said, honey, listen at the tone of our voice when we're talking about this. This ain't right. This ain't right. I don't want to go to hell. I didn't commit adultery. I didn't I didn't want any of that, but but Kevin, I, I sensed it. And I began to ask God, God, give me something in the Bible. God, I need I need I don't you know, I don't I've never heard of a message on resentment. I God I, and I began to study charity, think it you gotta write it down. The second thing and I'm hurrying. I'm I'm sorry. Uh, the second thing you've got to do is is put your story on hold. Listen to me, you gotta put your story on hold. Because you know what you do when you get hurt? You gotta you feel like you gotta vent. You feel like you gotta tell it. Let me share something with you. When you're really hurt, you may need to tell somebody, like a pastor or a pastor's wife or or something, somebody you're really confident one or two times and you know, just get it out and Share it with somebody, Brother Philip, and, and get it out. I'm not against that, okay? Is this okay? But you, you don't have to tell it to Sally. 
and Mary and Susie and Carolyn. And you don't have to tell it to this one and that one. And next thing you know, everybody in the church knows how you've been hurt. Or everybody in your family knows how Uncle John hurt you. Or everybody in there, they know how, they know how bad your son-in-law did your daughter. Because you're going to tell the story. Let me tell you something. I love you. But as long as you're telling the story, you're never going to get that filing cabinet out of your heart. How do you think I know that? I know it because of experience. You got to stop telling your story. You got to, you got to stop. Amen. Rewinding it over and over in your mind. There's probably been nobody here like me that's drove down the road and thought about the hurt over and over and over. And the more you're driving, amen, the more madder you get or the upset or frustrated you're getting. You're telling it over and over and over and over and over and over. You got to stop telling the story. The third thing you got to stop. This sounds crazy. But hear me, you got to stop spying. Yeah, never heard anybody preach on spying, Brother Rick. <laughs> you got to stop spying. You know what I mean. You know, hey, how's so and so doing? You just want to see if they're doing good or bad. You know, now we got social media. Now, I'm, I'm not against that. If you'd use it right. But you know, you, it's quiet, ain't it? You just, just see, see how they're doing. You, you got to stop spying. Did I say something wrong? I hope I didn't say anything wrong right there, Brother Phillips. You got to stop spying. You know what I'm talking about. You know, when it hurts you, how they doing? How's that church over doing? How's that brother doing over there? How, how they doing over there? Oh, my son in law? He left my. He left my daughter. He's got him another woman. His business is doing good. You got to stop spying. Because if you're spying, that's a sure sign. You got to file in cabinet. Now, I'm not telling you something that's easy. It's not easy. The fourth thing in closing. You you got to uh, you got to forgive. Whew. For thirty one years, this is a different story in my heart. For thirty one years, I uh, fought something that happened to me many many years ago. I've never told the story in any sermon I've ever preached. You've never heard Brother Rick ever tell a story. I'll go to the grave with this story. And I would pray and ask God to forgive me. Then it would come back up. Because I always thought that if you really forgive somebody, you forget it. And so that haunted me. Like you. uh, Preaching, pastoring, evangelizing. All through the years, all the four churches I've pastored, all the years I've evangelized, I'd get victory and then something would happen and that thought would come back up. And I'm like, God, please, I'm trying to forgive him. God, please help me. Because I thought I had to forget it. I'm, I was in my mind that you have to forgive and forget. But how do you tell a young lady that's 30 years old that you got to forget that uncle that molested you? How do you tell that wife you got to forgive and forget the husband that committed adultery on you? There's people that's been hurt to such a degree they will never be able to forget it. I mean literally forget it. Now, there's a scripture in Ephesians where it tells us to forgive one another. And it says, even as what God forgave us. And that would haunt me. God, you forgive and forget. is what I was told. Until I started studying the Bible about a year ago. Now, I know I'm going to get a little controversial here, okay? So, this is all me. But there's no place. Absolutely no place in the entire Bible that says God forgives our sin and forgets our sin. No place. Now, how do you get come to that conclusion, Brother Rick? Is God all omniscient? 
Is he all knowing? Does he know the past, present, future? Help me preach a little bit. He's all, how can an all knowing God forget? He knows the past, he knows the present, he knows the future. There is many times the Bible says that God chooses not to remember their sin. Did you get that? God chooses to remember. I will remember thy sin no more. Now for a songwriter, forgetting our sin is a lot easier to write about. I'm telling you, it's a lot easier than write, than saying God chooses not to remember. It's hard. You don't, there's not even a song out there that says that. There's plenty of songs that say God forgives and forgets. But he chooses not to remember. So when God gave me that, Brother Philip Horton, when God showed me that about a year ago, and I was fighting this other battle over here 30 some years because I couldn't forget. I mean, I would do good for maybe six months or a year, and something would say or done, and I would be someplace in America, and that would come up before me. Amen. And all of a sudden, I think, God, please forgive me again. I know it's been this many years ago. I know it's been that many years ago until the Lord began. I said, God, how, 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 how do I forgive even as God? Until I began to study and search out Ephesians 4 and I found out, you know what I found out? That I said, God, give me grace. When that comes to my mind, you know what I do? I say instantly. I'm telling you without a shadow of a doubt, it works. Let's all stand all over the house, if you will. I, I understand without a shadow of a doubt this works. You ask God for grace. When it comes back to your remembrance, I instantly say, God, give me grace. I make a choice. I am not going to remember that again. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you with everything within me that God supernaturally has helped me and gave me grace. And it's instantly went from my mind. But you've got to have a conscience choice That when it comes back up, don't let that thing. You don't entertain that. Huh? God help us here today. Lift your hands right here. Father, in the name of Jesus, we love you. We thank you, Lord. Help us to forgive ourselves. God, the fifth thing. Lord, touch somebody's heart. Here this morning, set somebody free, God. Good, godly, praying, sanctifying, Holy Ghost filled, fasting, seeking God, faithful to church, or battling resentment, God. Give us the victory, Lord. If we will be honest with ourselves.